into WebEx, only to Zoom. Uh, but anyway, I'll say hi like this. <laughs> hi, everybody. Um, yeah. And then I don't know if uh, you guys want to introduce me probably at this point. We just jump in. What do you think? I'll just do a very quick introduction. Um, so welcome back to the spring semester and our first Berk speaker series talk of the year. So I'm really happy to introduce Dr. Mary Hello Imordino Yang as our first speaker. Um, she's the Fami Italia Professor of Humanistic Psychology and Professor of Education, Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of Southern California and founding director of the USC Center for Affective Neuroscience, Development, Learning and Education. So just briefly, she's a former teacher and very prolific researcher who's been really influential in developing the field of mind, brain and education. And I'll let her jump into sharing her work with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And I'm sorry for the tech trouble. You'd think this far into the pandemic, we'd all know how to do this, but there's always something new that shows up. Um, so thank you so much for having me. It, uh, it's such an honor to um, to be invited to speak at this series. And uh, and also, I grew up in Connecticut, so it's like a little extra added connection. My parents are still there, so, so that's nice. I'm kind of with you in spirit at, in stores. Um, so I'm going to jump right in and um, and uh, try to remember to talk to the strange camera on the side so that uh, you don't have to look at the side of me. Um, and I've titled the talk Building Meaning Builds Teens' Brains um, to try to get at the notion that what may be a really fundamental driver of late adolescent brain development um, turns out to be you know, actually, it's not that surprising when you think about it, but it turns out to be the patterns of thinking and feeling about complex issues in the world. Um, we've been studying social uh, social issues, but um, we're going to start branching into other kinds of disciplinary issues, like patterns of thinkings and feelings about complex issues in mathematics or history or the arts or literature or, uh, you know, politics, whatever it is, right? Um, but but these studies we started with are, are pertaining to the social space because that's ubiquitous. Everyone needs to manage themselves in the social world to make sense of stories they hear, things like that. And, and what we find is that the ways in which young people dispositionally engage sort of effortfully with trying to make sense out of compelling stories that they encounter is related to uh, the ways in which they function day to day in their real social lives, um, but potentially even more powerfully, it's related to the way in which their brain, we can prospectively predict their brain development over the subsequent several years based on the way kids do this. And what's especially powerful about this longitudinal project's findings, I think, is that we also have IQ, full scale IQ on these kids. We also have uh, family socioeconomic status, educational backgrounds of their parents, all these kinds of things. And, and it's a very diverse sample collected around inner city Los Angeles. And, and what we find is that none of those other demographic variables where, are allowing us to predict future brain development the way that kids' own dispositions for thinking about the social world are. And I, th I think that's a, a very powerful message, both in the neuroscience of brain development and in education, where we're trying very hard right now is to think about what are the what are the ways that our education system could more strategically be designed to support mental health, persistence, deep thinking, civic growth, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, purpose. These kinds and and deep and deep um, intellectual understanding of complex topics. These kinds of very sort of reflective, generative ways of engaging with the social, the personal, the intellectual, the civic worlds are fundamental to mental health. They're fundamental to productivity. They're fundamental to the civic health of our democracy. And uh, in many. Uh, sort of progressive conversations, for example, in the National Academy of Education right now, people are realizing that these kinds of civic and dispositional orientations towards complex thinking uh, seem to be really essential for educational outcomes 
and for personal and life outcomes for young people and adolescents. Um, and so our data, I think, are making a bridge, helping us to understand what it actually looks like in a laboratory setting, what it actually affords us in brain development. You know, it's a first study. We're beginning a new replication. That's going to be another longitudinal study and things coming up. But, um, but I'm just going to kind of take you through a little bit of what we did. Um, and then again, I'm, uh, some of the work is published. Uh, some of the work, the longitudinal work, is right now being um, uh, finalized, the manuscripts for submission. So if anyone has criticism, suggestions, questions, uh, you know, anything like that, please, please, please uh, say or write to me afterward and let me know because we're just about, we're just about to submit um, the longitudinal papers for publication and I'd love any criticisms ahead of time. Be fantastic. Um, okay, so um, you're seeing my slides move. Somebody just say yes. Yes. Yes, yes great. Um, so, uh, so I'm, I'm starting the talk with this painting, which was done by uh, fr a good friend and colleague of mine, Margaret Lazari. Um, I do this a lot in in talks that are um, involve engaging multiple uh, multi multidisciplinary audiences, um, because I think starting with a sort of artistic rendering of the problem space is an invitation to everyone to kind of move together into this transdisciplinary conversation. Um, so this painting um, is is a is a in real life it's like a huge six by eight vibrant uh, vibrant uh, seascape of life and and Margaret painted it using some of our neuroimaging data. So if you kind of squint and look in the middle, there are these uh, white squigglies kind of floating in the ocean, you know, sort of being sloshed back and forth by the water. And what those you know kind of look like is reflections of the clouds or waves in the surface of the water. What they actually are some of you may recognize them as as white matter fiber track data right um that we you know we took the the cortical layers off the outside and kind of gave her the pictures of the of the white matter um underneath and and she painted them into this amazingly vibrant seascape of life with little you know uh, weeds tickling the bottom and and the brain itself its connectivity and all that and all its network complexity is sort of sloshing back and forth in the world around it um, and, and she has the warm sunshine shining down on it she has little red fish swimming by to represent the spontaneity of our creative ideas and and i want us to all kind of enter into a space together to think about brain development as not something that happens inside the skull of an individual but as something that is being constructed in a person as that person is dynamically adapting to negotiating within growing developing in a social and cultural and intellectual and physical space um, i see brain development as highly dynamic and not just context dependent in the sense that the context pushes on processes and warps them over time or biases them over time which is very sort of unidirectional but as much more a sort of dynamic situated sort of support process, much like the way Margaret has painted the white matter connectivity of the brain, which is, for those of you who are not neuroscientists, basically uh, all of the, the network of tiny little microscopic, you know, uh, billions of saltwater tails between cells that are synapsing, that are connecting onto sometimes hundreds of thousands of other cells in order to spread uh, information in organized ways around the, not just the brain, but actually down into the central nervous system and down into the peripheral nervous system all the way through the body and back up again. So it's kind of the, the network that makes a whole human. And <clears throat> so that's kind of where we start our talk. Um, and I'm not just gonna jump straight into a video um, that is uh, from Nova. Uh, it was a Nova episode in which we were featured um, a couple of years ago now, but it, and it's, you know, it's obviously not uh, representing the full complexity of the science, but it does give you a little bit of a sense of what we did, if this helps you to kind of um, understand what the neuroimaging procedures and things look like, uh, given education people in the audience. Um, and those of you in neuroscience, it gives you a, 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 a sort of intuitive understanding of how the methods work. Um, we actually interview people in depth. We've developed um, protocols for, uh, for recording and transcribing and coding and managing behavioral, verbal, affective, prosodic, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of postural, you know, things that are happening in these interviews. And then we can use the information that we glean from these two hour conversations with people, in this case with teenagers, but we've done it with other kinds of people too, um, uh, to then make sense out of 
processing that they do when they are then moved into the MRI scanner and asked to either rest, um, in the case of the longitudinal uh, studies, and just think about whatever they like, or uh, engage with these same social stories again and tell us how they feel about them in real, in real time. Um, and just so you know, like we're also doing studies of this, which I won't talk about much today, but I can, uh, uh, I can point you to, um, as they become available, if you're interested, reach out. Uh, also with teachers, teachers of adolescents, trying to understand how they make sense of their work using methods that are very much aligned with the ones we're using for the teenagers. So I'm gonna play just a little bit of this clip so you get a kind of intuitive sense of what it looks like. Um, yes. Hey, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm Mary Helen. Nice to meet you. Since her days as a teacher, University of Southern California neuroscientist Mary Helen Imordino Yang has been interested in knowing how emotions factor into learning. I quickly realized that there was very, very little known about the kind of stuff that we really care about in education, like how people become inspired. How do we become interested in things? How do we build curiosity? And how can we support that process? <laughs> in trying to identify which parts of the brain are involved in the deepest and most meaningful learning, Imordino Yang works with teens from troubled neighborhoods. We're going to be watching stories. We really want to know what you think. So there's no right or wrong answers. These are kids who see a lot of crime. They see a lot of dangerous things. They see a lot of poverty. And we wanted to understand how do they make meaning of that world around them. This first one is a story about a girl who lives in Savat, Pakistan. And the city was being taken over and basically run by a group called the Taliban. Um, so I want you to watch her when she was 12 years old. First, she gets them emotionally engaged in a topic by showing them videos about people struggling to overcome adversity. And I want to become, become a doctor. So how does her story make you feel? Um, this story makes me feel upset how she wants to be a doctor and continue on with her education, but it makes her sad that knowing her journey would be very difficult. For adolescents, these types of stories can trigger moments of deep reflection. They come back from those kind of reflective moments with this heightened appreciation of the meaning of the story and what it applies to in their own life and what it means for the nature of the world more broadly. And it's crazy how it's that powerful. Whereas we've known that for a long time in education, the neural data are giving us new insights into the mechanics of that process. Over here. To find out which brain regions are harnessed during reflective emotion, Imordino Yang monitors the students' brain activity as they re-watch the emotional videos in an fMRI scan. Good. So we're looking at the movement of the blood flow in her brain as she's watching the stories and where in her brain is becoming more and less active as she's experiencing these emotions. Okay, so I think that's that's enough. For those of you who are interested, you can go watch the, watch the NOVA. Um, but you get a sense of how the method works. And so then analytically what we're doing, we're actually also measuring psychophysiology in the scanner, and they don't show that. Um, and then uh, analytically what we're doing is looking for correspondences, basically, between the ways in which young people make meaning of the stories, um, judged by what they say when they're reacting to them, and they get very engaged with the interview. You know, in the first couple, they feel a little stilted, but then after a while, they're really just uh, get very moved, very engaged, and all the stories are about real teenagers from around the world, no actors, right? So it's very compelling. Um, and the stories are about a whole range of situations, some of which are very, uh, very moving, some of which are very inspiring, um, some of which are less so, you know, and they just engage with the stories and tell us what they think. They always answer the simple question, which is sort of ambiguously affective and cognitive on purpose. How does this person's story make you feel? Um, and, and so what we, what we basically show at a very, very basic level, and now there's been hundreds of studies, if not more, showing things like this, 
we first showed with adults, you know, in 2009 was the paper, right? Is that emotions, you know, people know emotions are sort of automatically triggered. Once you think about something in a particular way, automatically your body and your brain respond. Um, but what we're studying is a process that I think is generative and elaborative over time. It's at once cognitive and affective, and it integrates memory, different kinds of cognitive processing, perspective, feelings, all kinds of things into a sort of generative process of constructing what you might think of as a story or a narrative about your reaction to the thing, the way you feel about it. So in that sense, I'm really studying um, how people learn how to feel about things. So in other words, not what they feel about it. I feel this way or I feel that way. I'm much less interested in that than I am in how did you come to know that? What is the dispositional process by which you react to and start to process and make sense of information you encounter in the world and know whether it's moving, whether it's important, whether it's not important, whether it's inspiring, right? Whether it's compassion inducing, whether you should do something about it, whether it's angering, right? How do you come to recognize those complexities? And we're particularly interested in this process in adolescence because there is like a century of developmental science in adolescence, which has not been brought into the neuroscience literature yet at all, to my knowledge, uh, har hardly at all, which really showed that adolescent development is, is deeply focused around drives to build what we're calling now transcendent meaning, meaning that is transcending the concrete specifics of a situation. So when you listen to Isela talk about her reaction to Malala, she first talks about Malala, but then she starts talking about things that have to do with powerfulness and what it means to her, right? And we'll see that in a moment. Um, that process of sort of detaching, engaging with the world, in an empathic or direct way that's appropriate for managing yourself in the social space in the moment. Um, and then also a, as a kind of, sort, we think of it sort of like a seesaw pivot, pivoting into another space where you sort of pull away from the direct interactions in the world. And we actually have several papers with adults, with young adults and with teenagers showing that people, uh, and cross-culturally, that people, you know, do withdraw. They physically close their eyes, look at the ceiling, uh, stay their posture, right? They kind of, they stop talking, they have fewer words per minute. They kind of withdraw as they're in thinking about, you know, the bigger meaning and, and almost like gate perceptual information because it's not relevant what that girl looks like, uh, the, the bigger story of why schooling is a human right, right? Um, and then they come back with these reports of these, these broader narratives that they're constructing. So I wanna uh, show you an example of that. Um, so it's just like my little nephew is showing you here, I think that these processes of constructing dispositionally this bigger meaning, that's deeper understanding, this transcendent thinking, whatever you wanna call it, um, uh, is extremely important to education because it is what, allows us to dispositionally engage with knowledge building, creativity, thinking outside the box, and then integrating our knowledge over time to be able to use it. And it's also what allows us to construct a sense of self in the disciplinary space. It's what makes us feel that we belong thinking about math. It's what makes us feel civically engaged as part of our community. These kinds of mental constructions are in fact, I would argue, a kind of transcendent mental space that is at once affective, cognitive, drawing from memory, drawing from perception, but moving beyond memory and perception to create a new understanding that also leverages the past experience you have and contributes to your future ways of engaging. And so it is learning in the sense of sort of dispositionally developing yourself and your capacities for engaging with complexities in the world. Um, and that way of thinking about learning has been largely neglected in the education 
um, in the education science literature, although there is a lot of it in the sort of progressive civic education literature. And we're trying to really construct um, a, a deeper theoretical understanding and a, that really builds across disciplines. What would that, uh, you know, sort of wishy-washy, you know, sense of self and agency and of intellectual capacity and belonging actually mean for the development of capacities to think? And um, so that's the overarching orientation of this work from a from a kind of interdisciplinary perspective. Um, so just very, very quickly, for those of you who are not familiar with the with the neural findings. Um, so these are findings that we first, you know, these are just an example, but they were findings from a paper we we published in in PNAS in 2009. It was my postdoc work, basically, where we had adults reacting to stories, uh, adults across the lifespan, age 18 to 57, I think. And we, uh, you know, because we really, I didn't really want the first studies of complex emotional responding to be all, you know, college sophomores. No offense to the college sophomores in the room, but I just feel that these things are very developmentally, um, you know, they're, they're developmental. The way a 50-year-old feels and the way a 20-year-old feels about a story is not going to be the same. Um, but we wanted to first figure out, are we leveraging systems? So at that time, it was still an open question. Are we leveraging systems? for visceral somatic sensation, right? You know, the gut feelings for, for um, uh, you know, autonomic regulatory uh, sensation and responding in, um, in the anterior middle cingulate, right? And other regions that are somatosensory and, um, and that are involved in um, uh, conjuring consciousness, like in the brainstem, in particular nuclei. Um, so we have a whole series of papers built out of, around these st uh, studies looking at brainstem activation patterns, looking at um, consciousness levels, looking at um, uh, somatosensory activations, looking at um, different patterns of activation with different kinds of emotions and all that kind of stuff. But just very quickly, for those of you who are uh, uh, you know, not familiar with these things, you know, and from a sort of more phenomenological perspective that may invite the educators in the room into the conversation, you know, what we basically show, and, and not just us by any means, is that emotionally engaging with complex information that you really feel compelled to think about, that you feel is important, moving, and, and, and emotion producing in that sense by your own subjective report in real time. That's very important in our work. We never assume that when we give you a stimulus, we know what you're thinking, we always ask, right? Um, uh, emotional engagement with thinking about ideas activates the same basically the same brain systems that are involved in, in survival, right? That are involved in managing consciousness, physiological um, regulation in most basic sense. And then also systems that are involved in elaborating those maps of sensations and physiological regulatory uh, processes into what you might call feelings of regulatory and sensations, right? Which is another way of saying feelings of emotion. Um, and those feelings over time can become more and more cognitively elaborated. And, and in essence, that cognitive elaboration is what we're talking about here. We're talking about the power of engaging in that cognitive affective elaboration as meaning, as building meaning out of the things you've experienced. And we're looking for the neural substrates of that and the affordances of those neural substrates for healthy uh, uh, psychosocial uh, development. So. This is just a map uh, comparing uh, statistically places in the brain that were systematically more activated across people when they, these were adults, uh, when they said, I feel deeply moved and engaged emotionally with this story I'm thinking about right now, as when they, uh, compared to when uh, they saw stories that they said, you know, I'm not that, not that moved by this. I don't find it that compelling at all. Um, you know, and unbeknownst to them, there were stories mixed in that were meant to not be so compelling. I don't use the word neutral. I don't think neutral exists in the real world, um, but much less, uh, much less compelling, much less important stories, um, you know, about things that really happen to people, but they're more commonplace. Um, and so what we find is when people are telling us they're feeling very moved by something compared to when they're saying not so much, is that there are systematic activations, which, you know, the neuroscientists in the room will immediately recognize, uh, but I'll just point out in a broad strokes way for those of you who are not neuroscientists. So um, this white stalk in the middle of the head there and the, on the image on the left, right, you're looking right through the person's nose and tongue and slice straight through their neck, right? And again, um, 
Uh, we're not cutting the people, we're just cutting the brain picture, okay? Um, and uh, so what you see there is, that, you know, this is a this is a basically a densely packed stock of white matter fiber tracts and nuclei that are operating below the level of conscious awareness um, and that are sitting between the cortex and the and you know the whole rest of the brain and the face and body and in both directions, right? So it's kind of the bottleneck of neural, um, you know, sort of neural communication between the the brain, if you will, and the body. Um, and and so these structures in here, and and just for the neuroscientists in the room, these these uh, activations are very systematically placed. We can localize them to to groups of nuclei, and they also are robust when you control for physiological reg regulatory uh, changes, uh, because I told you we're measuring physiology at the same time. So these are really activations that seem to be associated with the experience of emotion, which really tells us that people are almost becoming more awake, right? They're actually leveraging brainstem structures that keep you alive, that make you beat your heart uh, when you're sleeping and breathe enough and all that, are actually being upregulated when people are deeply moved by things. Um, and then we also see activations in, for example, um, bilateral anterior insula. These are regions of the brain that are involved in uh, basically the most basic sense in feeling your guts. If you have a stomach ache, if your heart's pounding, that kind of stuff. There's now tons of work showing that they're also involved in all kinds of conscious feeling states um, in, in judgments of aesthetics, beauty, ugliness, uh, you know, a, a, any kind of a sort of subjective judgment like that tends to activate these regions, which tells you something. Um, and anterior middle cingulate, which is, uh, you know, involved in that kind of, you know, sort of physiological autonomic regulatory capacity that orients your attention. It also is involved in feeling pain and, you know, but these are systems in the brain that are deeply interconnected with one another and that are steering physiological regulation um, in ways that support survival related processes. And, you know, what we now know from a whole field of social effective neuroscience is that these regions are instrumentally repurposed for emotional and social processing um, and for dis complex disciplinary knowledge that you really are deeply engaged with. Okay. Um, we also see activations in regions that are associated with the so-called default mode network, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Um, I've written extensively about this. We have quite a few different uh, ways of, of looking at the default mode network versus activation versus deactivation in the experiencing of complex emotion states um, uh, that I can point you to. Um, but the basic idea is that only some kinds of deliberations on emotional feelings produce default mode activation, and some actually deactivate this network of regions. Um, and so, you know, basically these regions are activated when you are not attending immediately to the world. You know, when you're running or watching or a ball's flying at your head or you're driving a car in a traffic thing and somebody pulls in front of you and you're oriented to the outer world, the default mode becomes deactivated in these kind of what you might call task-oriented states. I don't like calling it that because that's as if feeling and thinking about a complex issue is not a task, it is, right? So in our data, what we found is that we systematically activated, and I think this might be one of the first studies that actually showed these systematic activations of default mode regions relative to baseline for a quote unquote task. And what was the task? How do you, tell me how you feel about this complex issue, right? So people were leveraging this kind of inner focus processing, which we called looking in versus looking out. You know, it's just a way to kind of get a handle on it in a 2012 uh, paper in Perspectives on Psych Science, um, uh, you know, sort of pivoting back and forth into the world and then into a, a sense-making mode. And we're trying to understand how people develop dispositions for that and how those dispositions can be leveraged in service of learning um, and development. So let's go back to Acela for a moment. Um, and, and I'm going to share with you uh, a sort of conglomerated transcript of things kids said and put together that you don't hear her say in the interview because she gets cut off. And we'll look at examples of how she's actually talking that are corresponding, they're kind of clues to these mental processes and elaborations that are um, in turn having these really powerful predictive effects on brain growth 
and on psychosocial outcomes in young adulthood. So she said, and you heard her say, um, this story makes me feel upset, how she wants to be a doctor, continue with education, it makes her sad, knowing her journey would be very difficult. Okay, so, so basically she's reacting to Malala's story. She is saying what she thinks and feels empathically about the girl she just saw. Very direct, what you might call concrete meaning making, super important, absolutely necessary to do. That is how you navigate empathically in the world um, with other people. Um, but you might get the sense that there's something sort of qualitatively different about the level of meaning making or cognitive affective thinking that she's engaging in, in the stuff highlighted in yellow versus the blue, right? In yellow, she is saying, this is what happened and it makes me feel like that. And this is what happened and it makes me feel like that. And her journey would be like that. So that makes me feel like this, right? Do, 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 back and forth, okay? And then she says, it's crazy how it's that powerful. And it signals, hey, there's something bigger here that isn't actually about this girl at all. Okay, and what happens next? She says, I mean, and she pauses. It makes me think about my own journey in education and how I want to go to college, hopefully be a scientist someday, right? So all of a sudden, she's in an inner world of self, of consciousness, where she is constructing a feeling of meaningfulness that's connecting to her own situation. And she says, even more, I guess what really hits me is how not everyone is able to get this chance to go forward with their life and get an education or do what they want to do with their life. I mean, it's not right right? She's now building what I would call a transcendent or abstract interpretation. This blue stuff is not about Malala. It's about what she's learned about the world, having engaged more deeply with the implications of what happened to Malala. She has built something that transcends that situation. And then from there, she makes a kind of moral inference. It's not right. Okay, that everyone can't do this isn't right. I guess when I think more, it's about me. It makes me feel upset that, yeah, um, others live in certain parts of the world where they don't want people to learn and they're trying to hold them back. But then her story inspires me to like uh, work harder. And these uh, pauses are also related to default mode activity and other studies, right? I can prevent those things from happening, maybe. It's about what am I learning from knowing that girl and what is true about the world? And that's not right. What's my moral judgment of what's true about the world, right? She's moving through these complex spaces. And then she says, everyone everywhere should have the chance. I mean, all human beings, right, should live free and choose their life future. So from engaging with this story, she builds something that is universally true in a moral and ethical sense about the entirety of how everyone in the world should be able to live. And it's that leap from makes me feel upset, she wants to be a doctor, right, to wait a minute, there's more here. There's more here about that I can use to learn about what I should be, what I could be, and how the world could be, and how I could prevent things bad happening and right by understanding these things. So what we find, so these are the these are the actual kids in the actual experiment, right? All kids of color, all low SES kids with at least one parent who's of immigrant origin as an adult, um, living in low SES communities around urban Los Angeles. 65 kids participated in these interviews and scanning and a whole bunch of other stuff with us. And um, we followed them over five years. Um, so what do we see? So, so first, and those of you who aren't neuroscientists, I will you know, explain the big picture of these findings. What we did was we coded all of their two hour transcript, right? Blindly coded them for a whole mess of 65 different ways kids could respond. They could have emotion, they could react to the person, they could say they should do, they could give advice to the person, they could take a perspective, blah, 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 right? And those are all published in uh, Rebecca Gottlieb's, uh, uh, is the lead author on a paper with me and uh, Fei Yang in a Journal of Adolescent Research, where we basically showed the meaning-making processes that kids were engaging in and the qualitative and quantitative ways that we can understand those. And in those analyses, after coding all these things, we basically ran principal components analyses that allowed us to see the big patterns in the ways kids were dispositionally engaging. And what we could basically show empirically is that there are two big kinds of meaning that can seem to be kids, kids seem to be moving between, and all kids did both. 
One is this more concrete, empathic, direct way, you know, oh, it makes me so sad that she wants to be a doctor, blah, blah, blah. And this more transcendent way, like all oh, Betty everywhere should have the right, you know. Um, and so what we did was we looked at those two kids' scores across the two hours on the more concrete way of uh, directly empathically engaging versus the more um, abstract transcendent way. And all kids did both, but they did them to varying degrees. And what's really interesting is it was uncorrelated with IQ, uh, the degree to which they did both, right? Um, and uh, so what we basically find is that this looking at, what I mean is this more concrete, direct, empathic responding was associated in a linear increased way across the experiment with more executive control network activation, right? And, and anybody who knows about the brain will recognize these spots here that I'm showing with my cursor. Right. So the more kids talked about poor her, I wish I could help her. That's not, you know, that's not fair. I want, I hope she makes it. Um, the more they activated executive control. It's as if they're using executive control systems to kind of regulate themselves in the social space to engage and manage and 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 not freak out or fall apart, but you know, but react to the person here and now. Um, and what we found is that the more kids did this kind of thing the better their relationships were. We had all kinds of surveys, all kinds of other interviews. We talked to their parents, we talked to their teachers, we followed them at school, blah, blah. Um, the better their relationships were, the better they uh, have acceptance of diversity among their friend group, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so this is actually related to their real world functioning in a very important way that helped kids be happy and do well. Um, the less they get in trouble, that kind of stuff. Um, and the more kids, and again, these two things are uncorrelated with each other. So kids could do a lot of both, a lot of one, a lot of the other, a lot of neither, right? The more they sort of engage in these looking inward, sort of dispositionally transcendent ways of understanding, invoking beliefs, values, curiosity. I wonder what happens, or all people should, be, you know, that should be able to do this, right? Those kinds of moral values and beliefs. The more they activated these blue to green regions, the, which basically correspond to core hubs of the default mode network. Um, uh, across the experiment, and the more they um, they creative and thoughtful and kind of realistic they were about appreciating how they might solve community problems. We asked them in a different interview. You know, uh, you know, you've seen this. There's gang activity. Why do you think that gang activity happens? Why do you think people? Why do you think that guy did that that you saw when he got held up? Um, you know, and these kids are more. They are more appreciating. They're more well appreciating that the broader sort of systemic. Uh, situatedness of those decisions to commit crimes as compared to saying, well, there's a bad guy who did something bad and that's what happened, right? You know, and um, so we've written about this. Uh, Imordino Yang and Connect, Doug Connect uh, 2020 and Ed Leadership, I can point you to any of these papers. Um, we have quotes from the kids talking about gang violence and why they think it happens relating to these two ways of making meaning. Um, they also do things like they score better on a standardized test of creativity, like how many ways can you use a brick and stuff. They're more divergent thinkers, okay? Um, and what we find is that, and you can read, there's another paper in SCAN from 2022 uh, with Rebecca Gottlieb as first author and me and Fei Yang, um, where we show that there's a kind of patterning to the responding where story by story, depending on whether the kid had an abstract or transcendent construal to that specific story, to Malala, but not to the kid who, you know, did something else, right? We can predict a certain pattern of brain activity patterns that is going to predict that they, you know, there's this correspondence to that kind of meaning making. And what we basically show is that abstract talk and that interview to a particular story is associated with increased default mode activity, increased executive control at the same time, executive control then going far below that kid's own baseline, default continuing, and all of these relationships are even more clearly related to predicting abstraction in the interview when the kid said they felt really emotional at the same time. So it's as if emotion in the context of this abstract or transcendent looking in thinking may be driving the patterns of thinking that are associated in a moment, I'll show you with learning and with brain development. For example, we show the more kids do that, the more they remember the stories five years later in a pop test. Okay. And we have no evidence of this for the more concrete, direct, empathic thinking. Um, adolescents' propensities to talk abstractly, right, to engage in this kind of transcendent, like, wait, this is very powerful stuff, also predicts their brain development after two years. Uh, controlling or not for IQ doesn't even actually matter very much, and young adult outcomes 
five years later. So what we find is that, so this is a very rough uh, sketch. This paper is being produced right now. Any comments, questions, methodological problems, please tell me them, uh, write to me, okay? But what we basically find is that at age 15 to 16, which is where we start, um, the way in which kids engage in this transcendent thinking, this abstract talking about the stories, is systematically trial by trial activating in a coordinated way executive control networks and default mode networks that are activating, deactivating, while the other one activates and they come, right? And so we've already published that. And what we find now is that those activations, deactivations, almost like a seesaw, we hypothesized would be growing the, the level of interconnectivity between those two networks, functional connectivity between those two networks, even at rest developmentally over time. And that's exactly what we find. So the more kids talked in these transcendent ways in the interview, the more at you know, resting state connectivity data, we see increases in the functional connectivity from wave one to wave two, two years later, uh, age 17, 18, um, between the default mode network and only the left executive control network. We don't see effects like this in the right. Don't know why, and we can post hoc speculate. Okay, but, but there are systematically, um, we're predicting the increase in the default mode to left ECN network connectivity at rest, the change in it, not the amount, and this is why the, when, even when you control for the beginning level, um, and we're controlling for gender, SES, uh, you know, all kinds of other things, IQ, um, okay, and whether or not we control for those things, it holds. Um, so we're predicting the change two years later based on how kids dispositionally engage in this meaning making. Keep in mind, all kids did it some, so everybody can do it. The question is, do you, right? That's what I'm really interested in knowing. Not what level are you at, but what is your proclivity of mind, kid? When you're walking around in the world and engaging with complex information, to what degree are you sort of dispositionally engaged to try to really make sense out of that? Or do you just move on, okay? Um, and what's really amazing is that that brain development, the change from, from wave one to wave two across late adolescence is predicting all kinds of core psychosocial variables that have been in the literature for decades as being really, really important for a successful young adult life transition, like identity achievement, which is basically about questions like, I've thought hard about who I am and what I believe in, and I've talked to people I care about and admire about who I am and what I believe in, and I've, I've come to understand that I believe in some things that are really core and important to me, and that's who I am. You know, these kinds of things as compared to things like identity diffusion, which is basically endorsing statements like, you know, I just go along with the crowd. I don't really have any strong convictions. What everybody else thinks is a good idea, that's what I do, right? Which is obviously not good for mental health or for achievement across your lifespan. Um, so what we basically find is identity achievement then by age 21, 22 is actually predicting satisfaction with all kinds of relationships in somebody's life with their achievement at school or work, depending on what they're doing at that stage and identity diffusion is negatively predicting these things. And the important thing to know here is that the transcendent talk at the beginning does not directly predict it. It only predicts it via the change in network brain development. So it's really telling us that as kids are doing the work of thinking across that two year period, that is what potentially is changing those connectivity patterns in ways that have instrumental value for their well-being and their growth and achievement when they are young adults. Um, so it's just kind of a, a, I'm putting this up here because there's a lot of really accomplished neuroscientists in the room, maybe if we can give me some feedback on the way I've been talking about this um, in a sort of conceptual way with educators and lay audiences as kind of like the salience, uh, you know, is, is kind of driving you to notice I should pay attention to the sort of inner meaning or the outer meaning. Um, so this is just a, a little bit of a, a visual metaphor. Um, we also find that transcendent thinking, this kind of abstract or looking in thinking, um, predicts, predicts a, a, a cortical development in cortical thickness across the same period. So we have a pitted against each other here, IQ, what does IQ predict? What change does IQ predict and what change does, um, does uh, this kind of complex thinking predict? 
And, and the yellow regions, which are basically middle temporal lobes for the most part, right, are being predicted by, uh, by IQ, okay? Um, but, it's the, but it's the transcendent talk that is predicting the lack of decrease or even increase for about half the sample in the cortical thickness of the anterior insula, core regions of the prefrontal cortex, medial frontal, uh, cortex, okay, and oops, sorry, um, uh, transcendent thinking, but not IQ, is predicting these are this these pictures are uh, the change in fractional anisotropy in the white matter fiber tracks using DTI imaging longitudinally. Um, so basically, what that means for the for the educators in the room, the connectivity, almost the wiring of the brain, is growing more even controlling for the starting point in kids who were doing more of this thinking, uh, whether or not you control for IQ. So it seems like thinking deeply about stuff is essentially sort of leveraging default mode systems for, for sort of inner meaning, cingulate and, and insula and brainstem systems for arousal, for physiological emotion processing, all kind of coming together into these dynamic patterns, which um, are producing uh, a growth over time. So I'm just going to close in the last couple of minutes with some examples showing what this growth can look like when it's supported by educational environments for adolescents. And I think these are really, you know, these are just sort of funny examples. They're, they're anecdotes, but they do point us to key ways that we need to innovate in the design of adolescent education. Um, so, so the first I'm going to show you is a set of, uh, of little responses from a group of kids. I had an NSF career award earlier in my career, which is one of these five-year, uh, you know, uh, assistant professor things. Um, and I, um, for my, um, for my uh, uh, educational activity, I really went to town. We basically put on a, a summer camp for three weeks for kids from across the city in which we paid for them to come to USC and spend three weeks studying affective neuroscience with each other and with us. And what we basically did was built out teams of kids from all over the place. And another way to say that in Los Angeles is teams of kids from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds, right? All of whom were incoming 10th to 12th graders in high school and who had expressed interest in participating. And unbeknownst to them, they were also the kids who had the very lowest socioeconomic circumstances that we chose to be their 20, because uh, we had like 98 kids try to sign up. We picked kids living in homeless shelters. One kid, I had to send her books for the to read behind ahead of time to the police station because that's where she could pick them up because she's homeless. Right, lots of uh, very low SES circumstances, but all the kids wanted to be in a neuroscience camp. So at the beginning, we sat each one down for 15 minutes. We talked to them privately about you know about a lot of things just to get to know who they were. One of the things we asked them is, "What is a scientist to you?" Right? What does it mean to be a scientist? And kids said things like, a scientist is good at science and math and needs to be able to memorize all the questions and have periodic table memorized and know everything about anything. It's very efficient. It's all about speed, right? A person who has worked in labs all day, taking info out of rats, a person with glasses that is skinny, they've been studying so hard that they don't have proper health and they're tired or weak looking. I always wonder why people want to be a, a neuroscientist if that's what they think it is. But anyway, a nerd who is antisocial did not like having much fun. Okay. What do they say to the same kids three weeks later after doing some science, right? Someone who can walk into a subject blindfolded and explore and eventually become an expert, right? What we've got is people who are dispositionally realizing that being a scientist is not what you can do, what you look like wearing a white lab coat and doing these things fast. It's instead about your disposition of mind. It's about the inner quality you bring to reflecting on what you notice, right? It's constantly working with instruments, right? Which come with no set of instructions, but persevering, right? Hello, growth mindset, okay? Um, almost completely opposite of what I used to think, right? Hello, awareness of conceptual change, right? That sort of self-awareness that you have changed how you understand something is critical for learning. Not only do scientists not spend all day in a lab, but they're engaged with other scientists, they collaborate, they're very engaged, they're very open. All of these things are dispositional about what scientist is, not what about a scientist can do, right? Cares about what others think and their ideas, any person who is curious. Okay, so it's not true that being curious makes you a scientist because you have to learn a whole lot of stuff, but boy, it's a way better place to start 
than what you look like and what you can do and how fast you can do it. And our schools for adolescents privilege what you look like, what you can do and how fast you can do it. That's just a little pearl I will drop on the table. We can have a whole nother talk about education implications if you want. Um, one other quote, this is from a kid uh, uh, who is uh, a Sudanese immigrant who failed out of New York City public school basically, and then was brought into a alternative school um, that my friend Doug Connect was involved with. Um, and you can go to this article and actually see the full, there's a link, you can see the full video of the kid explaining what he thinks about his math class, but it's the last day of school. He's explaining about his math class and what it meant to him to a, to, in a big public performance uh, in which the kids teach their parents and teachers about what they've learned. And he gives a, 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 a reflection and he says, I want to be the first person in my family to graduate from college but I never even imagined I could reach that level of math. Math at my school has helped me learn mathematically, learn how to think outside the box and different strategies, right? That's what math is. It's about, can I dispositionally engage with the world in a different way, right? When I was given a problem, I had to think in a new way, research ideas I don't know before. I've spent two months working on a problem called walking to the door. That's basically Zeno's paradox. You can go halfway, halfway, halfway to the door. Do you ever get there? How do you know if you're going to get there? Walking door. It led me to think about limits and the idea of asymptotes, right? He is now it's math is about ideas, right? I had to study fractions. I had to, I had to study fractions so I could learn about these ideas, right? All of a sudden you need the instrumental skills because they're in the service of something bigger and purposeful. You're turning education, putting the cart behind the horse for the first time. I had to study fractions through doing the problem. I got fascinated by finite and infinite. I was able to connect it to my life, right? And we see this a lot in these kids by moving between, I did fractions, I, I was fascinated by finite and infinite. I did, right? What you're doing, we think, is tickling up the interior single at the dorsal interior angle, the feeling of you makes the work feel relevant to your life. It's a kind of a new way of thinking about educational relevance. I can talk more about that for those interested. Um, so just to wrap up, you know, what I really think this means, meaningful learning shifts teachers and students' emotions away from just what do you see, what happened, Right? What did happen to this girl? How do I feel about that? Right? Uh, or how do I do fractions? Did I get it right or not? Right? Which I didn't really talk about any of the data we have with math, but okay. Two emotions that pertain instead to ideas. Is this a powerful idea? Does this idea connect to my life? Does this idea explain something true or just or right or important about the world or about me? Right? Those that switch from does all these things in the science lab to is dispositionally curious, cares about what others think. You know, it's about ideas versus about outcomes, results, being able to do things. And that is the shift. And it's a very fundamental shift that um, our systems need to make. I'm calling it a Copernican shift. I'm writing about that these days. Okay. We also have a study of teachers who are really effective in inner city environments at helping kids feel safe to think about ideas. And we're trying to understand how it is that they're doing that. Um, and you can follow us. Uh, at our website. I'm not very good about social media, but we do post new papers and things like that up there if you're interested. And you can also get all the references for the papers that I referenced in this talk. And thank you. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Is that good? Oh, yeah, you can go ahead. Stop sharing. Okay. Um, well, that was a great talk. Um, if we have a little bit of time for questions. Sure, um, of course. Yeah. So we have an in person audience. Anybody in the room have a question? And yes, I see a hand, I think. Go ahead. Hi, Mary Helen. It's, it's so nice to see you talk uh, about your work. And as usual, it was fantastic. Thank so you. just going back to, uh, I've always taught emotion is a very interesting thing to quantify, especially in any kind of research, especially educational research or neuroimaging research. And as we know, Correlations don't equal causation. So, as we, we, keeping that caveat in mind, around the uh, early middle 2000s, when uh, Dr. Candice Pert was talking about the physics of emotion and you know how emotions are not just chemicals, but they are more like electrochemical signals and 
in the form of peptides, you know, carrying messages across the brain and body. And she said something about sending vibrations to others. So when I was looking at your video that you just shared uh, with your uh, with the participant, Estelle, right? Uh, um, so when she saw Malala's video, if she wasn't really in person, but she was seeing over digital media, of course. So uh, what do you think about that thing about, you know, carrying information to cells at an individual level and sending these vibrations. So how does one integrate all this information and the idea of em embodiment and feeling another person's emotional state and reacting to that? Like, because she is sensing Malala's emotional states and reacting to it. So, mm -hmm. so how does embodiment play a role in this case when it's not really you and me talking in person, but seeing a video over media. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think there's a couple questions in there. At least I'm getting a couple questions. So one question is, what's the role of embodiment in re responding to other people? And another right. is, how might that be different in a digital context? Is, is right. that what you're saying? Okay, so in terms of the role of embodiment, I mean, there there is, a, as you probably know, a lot of research on so-called you know, what, what people call empathy or empathic responding or mirror, mirrors and all that kind of stuff, um, where people sort of, um, uh, uh, they kind of, um, there's a kind of contagion, right, in emotional spaces, which is clearly, I mean, all of these things have physiological underpinnings, right, but, but the mind is also real, the mind is the processes, you know, is the sort of, is the process of engaging the physiological stuff in service of something coherent. Um, and so, you know, I don't think so much as of quantifying the emotion as of quantifying the physiological responding, quantifying the neural responding, and then asking the person, how strongly emotional do you feel? And all of those are telling us different kinds of information about what that quantity is, right? Um, so, so that was kind of another piece of your question. But I think when we're responding like this, we're, what I think we're learning is that those kinds of direct empathic responses, either in person is very powerful, but also, especially when you're um, a mature adult or older person who's had lots of in-person experiences who can then vicariously sort of conjure as if experiences when you learn of somebody else's story and you can do this through video or through FaceTime or through, you know, watching media or movies, right? Um, that as you do that as you engage with them it's kind of an as if process where we 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 feel these ways empathically i i, I think I, the word i use for this is empathic resonance it's like we resonate with each other in particular patterns or not right we might hate the person and feel no sympathy for them at all right no empathy for them and and that's where things like genocides and holocausts right in, in their worst and racism come from right um so so but we are reacting in real time what I think our data speak to is another way of making meaning, which is neurologically quite distinct, it seems, from this more empathic responding. And one of the questions that we're really interested in starting to deep dive into, I'm doing this potentially with um, some indigenous scholars and Barbara Rog Rogoff's lab, Andy Dayton, others like that, who have really studied the ways that indigenous kids are sort of acculturating to one another in the embodied space as they learn. It's incredibly beautiful work. Um, you can go see little videos on the NSF website and stuff if you're not familiar with her work. Um, but what we want to understand is, okay, so we're acculturating ourselves to each other in the real physical space, but ideas and beliefs and moral um, sort of proclaiming that, that, that she does and these sort of transcendent sense of self and identity is not those actions. It, it has implications for those actions, and it's a sort of sum of the meaning of those actions, but it is a story about those things, right? So you have to, what our data suggests is you have to kind of withdraw. And people literally, we have a, another paper in 2018, I think. Um, excuse me about the sneeze, like I'm just getting over COVID. Um, 2018 um, in SCAN. Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, where it's called looking up to virtue, something, 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 default mode, something, something. But we're actually looking at adults as they become inspired about other people's uh, skills. 
right? So you have you have direct reactions to them, and then you have these kind of inspirational reactions, which go beyond, oh, that's so incredible, look what he's doing to wheat. That is something about moral fortitude. That is something about beliefs and convictions. That is something I can't directly see. And people actually distance themselves physically from the real perceptual stimulus. They close their eyes, they look at the ceiling, they do things like that. And we had, you know, independent raiders code people's behavior from the videos with the sound off and showed that when people do that, we can then later predict when they're in the scanner reacting to the same story, that we're going to see a particular constellation of neural dynamics that reflects an activation of the default mode with a deactivation of executive control and all these things in these particular ways. Um, so what we think is happening, and this is where the seesaw thing comes, is that when people are moving from a kind of like empathic responding resonance out here where you're watching people and feeling their emotions or reacting to their emotions, you know, either empathically or in reaction against. And then you're also sort of tipping into a place where you're not noticing. You have to distance yourself from the immediate surroundings around you. And you're in reacting instead to that person's qualities of mind, to that person's to that person's character, to that person's psychological situation, not to things you can directly see about them. And those are the kinds of, of, of construals that are associated with default mode activity uh, generally, but that also we find are growing kids' brains over time, right? So, you know, it's true, correlation is not causation, but prediction is pretty powerful, right? So we're taking kids at age 15, 16, and then we're bringing them back at two years later, and we can predict the degree to which they will have shown change based on what they did in the first visit, right? Um, so, you know, that's a pretty powerful argument for causal for causal uh, reasoning. Of course, nothing is ever causally, like it, there could be other variables we haven't measured, of course, right? Um, but, but what we're saying is that we think it's the act of moving yourself from engaging with people in the here and now and reacting to Malala and feeling bad and all that to wait, this is a bigger, broader psychological implication for the way the world should work. And it's that pivoting back and forth, actively using executive control to pivot that we think is both tickling up the feeling of you in viscera and stuff, which makes it feel relevant to your life, as the one kid said, and, and engaging and compelling, inspiring, right? It also makes people tend to then say, and it makes me think about my own life, what I, should I be doing? I could do something about this maybe, right? That comes up a lot. We've written about that too. And we think that that pivoting on your own accord is actually strengthening up the way those connective um, networks are actually co-regulating one another in the service of thinking. So, so I think about this kind of like exercise, you know? I mean, no matter your level of physical fitness, no matter your talent for sports, most people could exercise more. And if you did, you would get stronger, right? You would get more physically fit. And, you know, a talent for sports or a desire or ability to exercise more will not make you more physically fit. You have to do the work. And I think it's the same thing we're seeing here. The kids could all engage in this kind of thinking. The question is, to what degree do they bother to do it? And that is what we think is actually instrumentally potentially growing the brain. Yeah. So does that kind of answer your question? Yes. Yes, it does. Thank questions? you. Yeah, you're welcome. All Others? Right. Uh, I see some people online. Anybody else in the room? Okay. So Vikas, I will ask you to unmute yourself. We can sort of hear you. Okay, you can hear me. Okay, yes. So first of all, thank you for such a nice talk, Professor. And uh, I really like this talk. And uh, one of my question is a little bit hypothetical, but uh, it seems to me is like can be doable. Like once you ask that girl about her feeling, and you can divide it into a three kind of uh, uh, three basic. Uh, div you divide it into three measures. Like one is about when she is. She is uh, feeling sympathetic towards that girl, Malala. Mm -hmm. Second is about when she is thinking like more in abstract way about powerful kind of a statement that you have constructed. And the third is when she is becoming more about uh, 
thinking about solving it or being a part of that problem itself. So she's talking yeah, about self. I, yeah. How does, what does this mean for me? Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. so for yes. me, so for me, the construct of yours, uh, like most, uh, like the. For me, the thing is, you are talking more of about your problem with empathy to converting into our problem to solve. Like initially, yeah, thinking, say empathy converting into our problem uh, to solve. To, to solve. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's okay. right. Mm -hmm. And and from for, and now my point is, when she is initially asked to talk about her reaction, and uh, you are dividing into the, these three constructs of from your problem feeling about empathy to solving it by construct by considering herself as a part of the problem. Later on, after two or three years, if you will look around for the same reaction, will there be any difference for these three time points? If you, if she is, or, or like how she is ex, uh, expanding her time of, on those reactions, because initially she is spending some time on those reactions, one, two, and three. After three years, what should be her reaction? Will there be a decrease in the, empathy part and there will be an increase in where she is becoming more in problem solving thing considering it well, more that's a great problem. question i mean that's an empirical question we haven't looked at it over those years we have looked at a couple things that i think are kind of relevant one is how do kids you know ways of making meaning in this structured interview which is the same for everybody how do those correlate with the way they do this when we ask them about their own lives and we find out they correlate quite strongly if we ask them you know, we ask them about all the violence they've witnessed and crime they've witnessed, right, in the world. And then we ask them, why do you think that happened like that? Why do you think that guy did that, right? And the, the levels of thinking that they bring to those answers are correlated with the levels they bring. So, so kids are developing these, you know, so we're kind of capturing a disposition that they take out into the world. So that starts to line up the answer to the question. Um, yeah. But then, um, oh, where was I going with this? Um, oh, we haven't looked at how civically oriented they actually are. What you're basically describing is a shift towards civic orientation. Yes. That's exactly yes. what, right? I, 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 you know, yes. I notice your problem is something I should be doing something about. I, I engage with my community, make my world a better place, right? So so one thing we have done, and this paper is just about, uh, it's invited for um, Journal of Positive Psychology. It's just about to be submitted, it's almost done. But if you ask me in a few weeks, I can send it to you. Um, this is a, we have done intervention studies with um we partnered with a group called sages and seekers which is this amazing curriculum we help them enrich the curriculum too for low ses kids and families but it's an amazing curriculum that's intergenerational storytelling so it's teenagers and elderly people from the same neighborhoods and she brings them together like people sign up to be part of this thing and then they come over eight weeks for eight for for a full afternoon and they tell each other, basically it's the structured curriculum around getting to know each other and helping each other figure out, right, your story. So, so the kids are really kind of inventing a life story. The kids are teenagers, right? They want to decide who they're going to be um, and why, right? And the elderly people are kind of doing a life review, right? This is very Ericksonian, you know, for those of you who study psychology, right? They're trying to figure out what have I accomplished in my life? What do I have to give back, right? And both people, so both people are very much in need of formulating, reformulating, reformulating their life story as a source of, of sort of um, motivation for engaging with action. And what we show is that, so we have the kids, um, we have a lot of studies, we show that the adults, the, the elderly adults working memory goes up and all that kind of stuff. But with the kids, we do these weekly video diaries where they pick up their phone at the end and the camera and they tell us for a minute or two, how are you feeling about today? What are you thinking about? What, you know? And, and so we code those answers over time. And then we also, at the end, they write a tribute. They write an essay, right? And these are low SES kids failing out of school, someone, whatever. They sit down and they write an essay. They write a speech that they read for their partner, Sage, um, in front of everybody on the last day. It's incredibly moving. And so these kids write a 1,000 word or whatever word they want. Um, speech about, you know, anything they want to say to their sage. And so we coded those also. And then we also did survey measures, you know, standard survey measures of, of purpose, life, purpose in life and how that changes, uh, wisdom, you know, all these kinds of things. And what we basically find is purpose in life goes up, right? But it goes up more 
in kids who have high levels of transcendent meaning making in their video diaries and so high level to start in, is predicting and additively increases in transcendence over time is predicting increases so it's like engaging with these dispositional ways of making meaning is actually helping kids decide what their life is for over time regardless of the content of what they're talking about what we what we're, what we're coding for is you know is this a big broad life lesson you're saying or oh today we had a really great time me and marta we really love to laugh we did this and that it was really fun i think she's so great you know um as compared to like marta made me realize that everyone goes through hard things and here's how you handle it right where it's like a bigger thing right um and what we find is that kids shift to these bigger interpretations of the same idea that came up early in the in the in those eight weeks but they revisit it over time like how to do family things like that and those shifts are associated with increases in life purpose and in uh what we're calling complex emotion things like gratitude and compassion and inspiration as measured at the end in the tributes that they talk about what do they talk about this having meant for them so so we can show that supportive relationships and opportunities to stop and make meaning of the things that matter to you um, are instrumentally uh, so, uh, are instrumentally you know sort of uh, supporting increases in many kids in their disposition toward thinking this way. So we don't yet know the full answer to your question, right? Well, what, how will this happen over time? But I imagine what will happen having studied adults, young adults, adults across different cultural contexts like China and different places, things like that. Um, you can find those papers on our website. Um, is that you don't get less empathic stuff and more transcendent stuff. What you get is more appropriate, more appropriate noticing and skilled, regulated noticing when a situation calls for a more empathic way of responding and when it's something that calls for a more reflective way of responding, right? Um, so just as a very intuitive way to understand this really quickly, one of the things that I sometimes say when I'm, when I'm teaching these ideas, um, you know, me and the grocery store, okay? I'm walking around, I'm doing my weekly shopping. I've already read the ingredients on all the kinds of bread. I know which kind of bread I'm gonna buy. I know I want this kind of cereal and not that kind of cereal because I've already read it and made the decision. It's just an action at this point, very concrete. I want Cheerios, I want this, I want that. You get to the fruit and you have to stop and say, wait, decisions about what fruit to buy. I live in Southern California. I don't need to buy fruit from halfway around the world. We have fruit here. Let me figure out what's in season and coming in because that's more environmentally responsible. You know, I mean, it's just a trite example, but or you get to the fish and you have to think, I don't just always buy the same fish. I have to stop and think, what is the more responsible choice this week, right? And so knowing, when it it makes sense to stop and think about something more deeply and when you're wasting time to sit and deliberate over cheerios is a waste of time i already know i buy cheerios buy cheerios just do it and move on with your life knowing when is appropriate to do what that is what i think we're going to see major development into adulthood okay that's what you see it's not about more of one and less of the other it's about doing them more appropriately and all kinds of civic transgressions right all kinds of even severe civic transgressions like holocaust and and homos and, and and genocides are basically about moving shifting the line between empathizing and ideas right all of a sudden you have these big broad ideas about who's superior or whatever and like those ideas translate into no empathy for you. I'm gonna make you a group that doesn't count as human, right? Or or the other way, you get all stuck in the helping people here, helping people here as an emergency room physician. And now you can't manage the whole space and you got people dying while somebody's, you know, you need to triage, right? So you have to know in a space, how do you move between a more concrete interpretation and a more abstract one, depending on the, the situation, what matters in that situation? And that is what I think is really maturing. Does that answer? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. This. Uh, thank you.
thank you for that. And and one last question, very small one. Like, uh, how is the uh, social economic status going to determine the empathy part in particular for a particular? Sorry, situation? I didn't understand the first thing you said. Could you say it again? Yeah. So so how is the social economic status as a oh, value? Social economic status related it's to empathy. It's yeah. 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 Um, okay. So that's a kind of a complex answer. You can read about it. We have one paper in human brain mapping that's about the role of violence exposure to empathy and empathic brain development. Okay. And we have a longitudinal analysis on violence exposure we're about to publish. So you can see those because violence exposure is highly correlated with socioeconomic status. Not a surprise. Okay. Kids who are from poorer families are seeing more crime. Um, uh, so that's one thing. But then what we found, actually, we have different ethnic groups of kids in the study on purpose because I wanted to know longitudinally as we follow these kids over time, do the things that we find actually show up in two different ethnic groups of kids? So we all the kids have parents who have immigrated as adults, were born and raised to adulthood in another country, and they're representing like 14 different countries in the world. And mostly they're from East Asia or Central and South America. So kind of Latin, I think that's a, that's a big range of people in both places, but you know, those are, so we have a, a kind of big, broad comparison built in. Then there's people from some other Ghana and some other places, okay. Um, but we wanted to know, are the East Asian descent kids and the Latinx descent kids both doing this the same way? You know, it's just kind of a preliminary look. What we find is that there is no difference in the transcendent thinking, in the abstract, complex thinking that grows the brain, no difference by gender, no difference by ethnic group, no difference by SES, no difference, no, no, um, no difference in transcendent thinking by IQ. Okay, and the IQs range from like 79 to 132 or something. There's a big range of kids in there. Okay, um, but we do see that the concrete thinking, the direct empathic thinking is related to sort of cultural norms and to gender norms. So I think it was Latina girls were higher on average in concrete thinking. So they were more directly empathic, more responsive and to the person and all that. But keep in mind, empathic concrete responding is uncorrelated with transcendent responding. It doesn't mean they can't do more of the big meaning too. It just means they do more of the direct concrete relationship building stuff. Um, so the Latina girls were particularly high on that. Um, so there was a kind of a cultural and a gender effect there. So does that kind of answer your question? I mean, I think it was very heartening to me. And I think really kind of frankly, politically sort of nice <laughs> that it turned out that there was no effect of IQ or of gender or of cultural background or of parents' socioeconomic status um, or of parents' education level on transcendent thinking. So your mom can be have, have gone only to third grade education and teach you to think deeply about the world. You know, that's what that means, we think. We haven't gone and interviewed the, we interviewed the parents, we need to go back and look at those interviews, right? Or you can go, do a PhD and, and, and be pushing your kid to just get it done, move faster, go, that's what success is, and not be thinking dispositionally about the deep meaning of the world. You know, that would be the interpretation, although, you know, future work is needed. I think that's actually kind of cool. Very cool. Right? It also kind of aligns with what we know, you know, kind of by intuitive wisdom. You know, people people can be deep thinkers regardless of what their opportunities have been. If they've been supported through relationships to think about issues deeply. And in fact, maybe it's partly because these kids parents are immigrants. All of them, by definition, came here probably for a better life for their kids. They're already vision driven, right? So maybe that's why. I don't know. All right. I'm not seeing any more questions. So we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you again so much. You're for welcome. Thank you for having me. Sharing your time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Bye, everybody.